But the core of what we do also is to bridge the gap between the field and our communities by redefining what therapy is, right? I mm -hmm. think a lot of times people shy away because they don't trust the system, right? We don't trust the system for a reason because it's not Good meant reason. for us to thrive in, right? Mm -hmm. Like it is not created for us. And so we wanted to, one, change the system. And I feel like we're, we're, we're one of many people out there really doing that, right? There are more people at the forefront. You will find more people where it's like, no, this is, this is for us. Hey, family, my name is Ebony Harris. And I'm Elisa Bokeen. And we are two brown chicks changing the face of therapy on both, both sides, sides of, the couch. of the couch. And you're doing life with Lakeisha on Living Her Truth. Welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast, where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Woodard from LakeishaWoodard.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week, you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Hey family, welcome to another episode. I am so excited that you are here and I don't take it lightly that you decided to hit that play button and spend about an hour of your time with me. So with that being said, I want you to know that I'm 100% invested in your self-awareness journey. So you better believe that every week I'm bringing my A-game for providing you the tools necessary to live a more fulfilled, purpose-driven life. So family, I want to remind you to please take a moment to leave a five-star rating and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Because as you know, I set a lofty to goal to touch 1 million hearts within the first two years, and I can only do it with your help. So please remember to download each episode, share the conversation with at least four people you know, and repost on your favorite social media platform. And don't forget to tag me at Lakeisha Woodard. Also, in the show notes, there is a um, link that says join community. You can click on that link so we can stay connected and continue the conversation. Well, family, this is the last week in our Strategize Your Vision series. I really hope that you enjoyed it. And I really hope that you learned the necessary elements of creating a rock solid strategy for manifesting the vision that you have for your life. And today's conversation is super special because I am sitting down with two of Houston's most dopest melanin therapists to discuss personal growth, relationships, sexual wellness, and more. And yes, I said sexual wellness and we're talking about it today, okay? So I'm gonna need you to leave your shrewdness in the other room with your kids while you sit, listen, and learn, all right? Now, let me formally introduce my two favorite people to you. Elisa Boquin is a licensed psychotherapist with a private practice called the Relationships and Sexual Wellness Center in Houston, Texas. She specializes in trauma, relationships, sexual wellness, and women's sexuality. Ebony Harris is a licensed relationship therapist in Houston, Texas, and the founder and host of Room for Relationships sex and relationship podcast and the website by the same name she loves to help adults communicate with clarity and honesty love with passion and intention and teach their offspring the value of boundaries compassion and trust together elisa and ebony launch melanin and mental health born out of a desire to connect individuals with culturally competent clinicians committed to serving the mental health needs of black and latina hispanic communities Family, I hope you're ready for some grown folk conversation with my girls, Elisa and Ebony. Elisa and Ebony, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. Thank you for, thank having, you us. for having us. Are you kidding me? I am so excited that you got here. <laughs> I am so excited that y'all are here. I'm excited about this conversation because I know it's going to be, I know it's going to be good because I got history with you guys. So we yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> I was like, let me pull out my book. <laughs> right, right, right. 
Yes. <laughs> so, let's talk about that because I like <laughs> to um, start every conversation just talking about how I come to know the people that I'm talking to. And this conversation is no different. So I have to go way back in the day pre-COVID when it was Pre. cool to like see people in person and do like networking yeah. events. So um, I was doing networking and, you know, just telling people about my business and, and coaching. You guys know that I'm really um, transparent about sharing my story of surviving sexual abuse. And so as I'm talking to people, melanin and mental health kept coming up because I'm a huge advocate about therapy. And so people will always say, well, have you have you met melanin and mental health? Because they ain't say y'all names. Right. Would be like, have, y'all, have, have you met melanin and mental health? <laughs> First, middle, last name. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Right. And so, um, so yeah, so this name kept coming up. I'm like, no, but I'm obviously I need to, I need to get to know these, these women. And so um, just so happens um, speaking engagement with my one of my favorite nonprofits here in Houston. You guys have heard me talk about them on the podcast, Queen Life. Shout love out to them. Candace. Candace. Yes. We love, love her. We love Candace with, with Queen Life. And so um at the speaking, at the speaking event, and going around the room and uh, introducing ourselves, and you know, Alasa, uh, Elisa. Elisa, yeah. Elisa, uh, introduce herself and just so happened to say melanin mental health. And I'm like, oh, I need to get to, I need to say something to her because people have been telling me <laughs> you need to meet melanin and mental health. So, um, and I just thought it was just you to be honest with you. You know, uh, it wasn't until we actually got together that I realized that it was a pair of you. It was two, mm-hmm. two of you guys. So went over, talked to her, you know, told her what I just told you guys, how everybody is saying I need to get, you know, I need to uh, clap. (laughs) And I ended up being on you guys' podcast between the That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. And um, that was so much fun because we actually sat on the couch. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Pre-COVID. The good old days. We actually sat on the couch and just had a really good, conversation just mm-hmm. had a really good conversation mm-hmm. and so yeah so that's how we come to know each other yes. so how did I have a podcast sure. I'm like I'm gonna have to bring my girls back on um or bring you guys on my podcast so we can <laughs> yeah and so yes yeah, so I would love to know how did you guys meet and how did y'all come up with melanin and mental health because let me tell you something that name because you know we melanated like that <laughs> name just makes me feel it just makes me feel good. It makes me feel welcomed, if you will. It's like right. I love that. I love that name. So tell mm. us how did this how did this all come about? So Alisa and I met via social media. Um, we were both using social media as a way to put our information out. Both of us are in private practice, we're relationship and sex therapist. And mm-hmm. we were using that as a way to like kind of just market ourselves, which a lot of therapists weren't doing because we have this whole thing about as therapists, you're supposed to be this blank slate. People aren't supposed to know anything about you. Um, but I think me and Elise are rebels. So we were using the social <laughs> media as a way to kind of share. And we were following each other on, do you even use Snapchat? We were following each other on Snapchat. I don't even use that anymore. anymore. I don't either. <laughs> but, um, and I, I happen to like do a video of like, yeah, I just left lunch with a therapist and, you know, I'm doing networking and things like that. And so Elisa slid into my DMs. And was like, I want to, I want to network with you. I want to do lunch together. And so we did. Um, and the, one of the first conversations was just about like, who do you refer to? Like when people reach out to you, we're both relationship therapists. We don't work with kids. We don't take insurance. So when people are reaching out and saying like, well, do you take insurance? Or do you work with this population or, you know, anything that's not our specialty? She was like, how do you decide who you want to work with? And I was like, I don't know. Like it's, it's a struggle. Um, and so we kind of discussed like some of the people that we knew that were uh, clinicians of color, that were um, Black and Latinx clinicians. Um, but the conversation, like every time we will meet after that, we would continue to talk about like, who are you meeting with? Who are you, like, who are you referring to? And how do you know who to refer to and things like that? Because while cl- clients definitely want to talk to someone who has a specialty and, and, want, and works with their particular issues, mm-hmm. especially when we're talking about Black and Latinx communities, we also want to work with somebody that looks like us. And so we me and her knowing that it was like, okay, we got to figure out how to like refer to other people. We need to figure out who we need to refer to. 
So we're having this conversation. And then at the time, this is 2016. In 2017, at the beginning of the year, Elisa has this spurt of inspiration in the shower. So I'll let her tell the rest of that story. <laughs> yeah, Ebony wasn't in the shower. So. I wasn't there. <laughs> Well, yeah, so 2017, at the beginning of that year, it was January also, and just as so many of us do, you know, at the beginning of the year, we have certain, um, intent. I call them intentions, because I don't make resolutions, I set intentions for the year, but one of my intentions for the beginning of 2017 was that if I had some sort of divine inspiration, which we often do, we'll have these ideas and I, I thought to myself, if I have some sort of divine inspiration, I'm going to go with it. I'm not going to talk myself out of it. I'm not going to be a perfectionist around it to where, well, I'll do it when I have all these things in order. And as Ebony mentioned, um, I love social media. Absolutely love it. And before being a therapist, I was uh, in marketing. And so I knew that it was going to be a powerful tool to be able to market. So I was in the shower and just like so many of us have these stroke of insight in the shower um and that name melanin and mental health just kind of came to me and I was like "Ooh, what is melanin and mental health I don't know but I like it so I immediately got out of the shower and back then I was using that app word art and I and I kind of like quickly did something of melanin and mental health and I said I know what I'm going to do I am going to put out some content uh, for our communities, for Black Latinx communities. And it's going to be about mental health, but it's not going to have psychology jargon. It's just going to be like how we would talk with our girlfriends or with the fellas, just having a conversation because I wanted it to be approachable and I wanted it to be relatable. So I started the account and really quickly, it just kind of blew up. Um, you know, you a lot of times you'll hear like, oh, people are trying to, by followers and this and that, it, it, it just organically like began to grow and grow. And so that told me there was a lot more people that were interested in this. People were sending messages like, what is this? What is melanin mental health? I love it. You know, I love it, but I don't know what it is. And I was kind of like, I don't know what it is either, but let's see what happens. So had the Instagram, had the Facebook also, and we started to get a really decent following. So it was probably what, like, March or May? March, I, think, yeah. I think it was May. Or was it March? March is when um, we started talking about when we had the event in May. Okay. So again, we're talking about like, let's gather these therapists together so we can have a happy hour. We've been saying this since like October or November yeah. of the year before. Like, let's just go ahead and, you know, plan this happy hour. We'll get like five people to come out. I don't know if you've ever tried to plan a happy hour with other professionals in your, <laughs> in your field. It sometimes can be hard. So we thought we'll have like maybe five people come out and then we'll be able to refer to these other people. Um, and Ebony said, you know what? I'm going to put it as an event on Facebook to see if anybody else wants to come out. So we had about 30 people come out that night, which nobody really knew anything about us. They, it was just, hey, we are going to get together. And if you're an advocate for mental health, if you're in the field, come out, meet other people in your community. Um, that are also as passionate about the healing of Black Latinx people as we are. And we were so surprised by the turnout and everybody kept saying the same thing, like, we need this. I'm a nurse. I need to be able to know where to refer to. I'm a student. I need to kind of find my way in this field. I'm a therapist. Yes, let me take your card. Let me take your card. Um, so Ebony and I are therapists, but we're also entrepreneurs. So I was like, we're going to meet next week. And we're going to talk about what we're going to do. It was the next week. It was the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Elise was like, we need to talk. <laughs> Let's go. And she and, she and I, it, I mean, you hear a lot of bad things about partnerships, but she and I, like, just, we parallel think very well. And we also complement one another very well. Mm -hmm. And so we started talking, we're like, I have this idea about this directory. And she, Ebony's like, wait, I've had this idea. I will show you. I've been having this idea. <laughs> and so from there, we're like, let's create a website. We're going to put together a national directory. There are directories already. At the time, there wasn't as many geared around people of color. Mm -hmm. um, there was one major one that isn't, you know, 
wasn't, we wanted it to be primarily, you're looking for this type of thing. Yeah. And so we're like, we're gonna put together this national directory. It's gonna be specifically for our communities, for our people, um, let's get to work. And so from the website, we started building it. We kept having the events and everything just kind of trickled from there. You know, where now we have the podcast, we have the directory, uh, we have the merchandise. Mm -hmm. And it was all sort of this, I don't give this recommendation for people as far as how to plan a business. But for us, it was like we were being led the whole way. We, even with the merchandise, we started to wear shirts just for us to have and look cute at our events. And people are like, where can I get this shirt? I'm like, well, let us get back to you, you know? <laughs> so, so yeah, it's a lot of it we've been led and kind of gone along the way. Cause you got to remember at the same time, we're both still trying to grow our practices. We already have a business we're trying to grow and the melanin and the mental health kind of chose us. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that story. And I love how you said that, you know, you guys just follow where you led, which comes back to self-awareness and purpose, which is what we is, which is what I focus on here on the podcast. And then, you know, you guys also in my business too, because, you know, yeah, we can have a plan. We can put a plan together, but sometimes we just need to go where the spirit leads us, you know, because we, no, yeah, we have no idea what the, what the journey is going to look like, but I, I love the name melanin and mental health because it gives us ownership. When I hear it, it gives me ownership as a black woman to take my mental health seriously because mm -hmm. therapy is already, it already has a stigma attached to it. Right. I, I think that we we're, we're starting to chip away at that stigma mm -hmm. to be honest with you, because we get yeah. more comfortable yeah. with it as a, you know, as a community, but who, who would have thought that you guys, you know, there was a, um, problem with connection with with among therapists you know mm -hmm. other black mm -hmm. therapists you know trying to yeah. get to know each other so you can be able to you know recommend clients to uh, or potential clients to other people you know that never yeah. even like crossed my mind but right <laughs> yeah I think a big part of it is though as professionals like most of us as uh minorities black and latinx like when we're in our programs we're not the majority right it was only like one or two of us in the programs and so even like i think about when i first got licensed and i would start networking i would go to events and i wouldn't see other therapists that look like me and so it's not that we didn't exist it's just we didn't have spaces where we felt comfortable because there are certain topics right. and certain conversations that lately have become more popular but when i got licensed in 2011 like these topics like talking about police brutality and racial battle fatigue and, and how racism impacts our mental health those weren't topics that were being discussed with other colleagues and so mm -hmm. i think that you know we we i assumed that there were other people that that existed that looked like me and cared about my communities and things like that but when you would go out and network and talk to people that just wasn't who you were seeing mm -hmm. um so i think like you said it, it, you you probably wouldn't even think like that's an issue but as you are thinking about okay this client is calling me and i'm like hey i wanted a black therapist but i want a black therapist that work with kids and i'm like i don't work with nobody kids that ain't my specialty yeah. that's not what i'm interested <laughs> in so now i have to figure out like how do i find black clinicians that work with kids you know and, and we just don't see us out and about and so that's that's what that was one of the things that was really special about melanin mental health is just like it's so many of us that are doing so many different things and we just didn't have a space to feel comfortable going and showing up and having these conversations so right yeah because we think, uh, as black people we, we're out there we're out here doing doing our things in all industries but it, it's hard to it's hard to find us and so we tend to think that okay maybe there are no black doctors yeah. there are no black therapists and it's like mm -hmm. yeah it is there is, there there is. is. mm-hmm well, then I think a big part of melanin and mental health was at the core is we were really motivated also by our own need. Like we needed yeah. to, to be able to meet this need that we have because it's so important to Ebony and I that we can trust the people we're referring to. We had a need also as grad students to be able to figure out how do I show up in this profession and still show up as myself because that's not what's taught to us. You know, therapy is primarily centered around white folks. I mean, that's just that's just how it is, right? And so our cultures, our ethnicities, our traditions are not necessarily classified all the time as professional, as so many people in different industries can probably tell you, you know? And so 
it was difficult for us to not show up as ourselves. And so as a clinician, you really start to, again, I, I think this isn't unique to the mental health field. I think a lot of us deal with that when we're showing up at work. Can I show up with more of me? Can I show up with the big gold hoops and still be con considered professional? Can I show up with the hair? <laughs> right. Can I show up with the hair looking right. natural to me and it still be considered professional? And the message that we that we get is no, you can't. And so we wanted to show, yes, you can. Like, this is what a therapist looks like also. And we're professional and we're trained and we're good at what we do. And so we needed to create a space for other people coming into the field as though, as well as those that are already here. And it was also really important for us. Ebony and I are both very, very passionate about helping our communities heal, right? Mm -hmm. Like we wanted to be able to get this information to our people. And so we needed to do it in a way that was relatable. One of the, at the core of what we do also is to bridge the gap between the field and our communities by redefining what therapy is, right? I think a lot of times people shy away because they don't trust the system, right? We don't trust the system for a reason because it's not Good meant reason. for us to thrive in, right? Mm -hmm. Like it is not created for us. And so we wanted to, one, change the system. And I feel like we're, we're, we're one of many people out there really doing that, right? There are more people at the forefront. You will find more people where it's like, no, this is, this is for us. We always quote um, our friend and colleague, Dr. Manuel Zamaripa, who's a psychologist in Austin, who was on the podcast also. And he said, therapy is ours. And Ebony and I kind of were like, wait, say more. And he's like, our cultures have traditionally always sought out the counsel of an elder, of a wise man, of a medicine woman in the community. We've always done that. Yes. It's just that therapy, again, as it is created today and historically in the field, it wasn't meant for us. But we have always sought out therapy. So therapy, this is, this is what we do. It's not that we don't want healing. We just want to trust the people that are doing the healing. Right. Wow, mind blown, because you are, <laughs> he is so absolutely right. Our mm -hmm. culture, we always see counsel of, of elders, which is pretty much, mm -hmm. you know, the, the same thing almost in, in therapy is like how it mm -hmm. works into, into therapy. You know, you guys, I'm, I'm going to join your, your, your plight in um, helping people to really like show up as they are when they go to corporate, because it's so funny that you guys brought that up because in my business, I am working on pivoting to corporate because I want to help corporations to really accept the employees as they are so they can bring all of their natural talents and gifts to an organization. Mm -hmm. Because just because you hired me as a secretary doesn't mean that I don't have the skill to, to draw and to paint. It doesn't mean that I don't love social media, social media marketing, you know, so you can like, they can literally tap into their employees to grow and expand their, mm -hmm. their corporations and their businesses, but they're not using their employees, you know, um, correctly because we're showing up thinking we have to be this one way right when we go into the nine to five because this corporation is not going to accept me as I am in all of my glory so so I'm working on pivoting to corporate to get them to understand that and then help their employees to become more self-aware so they can understand what their natural gifts and talents are and how they can apply it to their nine to fives because let's just be real everybody don't want to be an entrepreneur and that's totally fine right. You know, but you can be an entrepreneur at the corporate mm -hmm. nine to five that that you have. So, mm -hmm. so yes, yeah, so I'm going to join you guys. I'm going to join you guys on that flight. So that's, what, so that's what I'm working on. So thank you for confirming that for me, girl. Thank you for yes. absolutely. So you know, 2021 right is here, and you know by probably like July of 2020, people was over. People was over it. They was ready. <laughs> For 2020, you know, 2021 to, you know, to yeah. get here. And, you know, we can, we can understand why, right? So my question to you guys is, what's the first thing that we should work on? Because I don't want people to think that just because the clock struck 12, that all of the, the problems that, you know, um, 20, the pandemic, 
exacerbated, didn't necessarily cause, but exacerbated, it's just going to like go away. So what is the first thing we should work on for personal growth? I, I definitely, you know, when we talk about growth, I'm, I'm really big on like assessing where you are right now right? Assessing what's going on and understanding like what's happening in my life right now and what do I want to be different? Uh, but in the vein of what you just said, like I also, and this has kind of been like my message since I feel like since we've started Melanin and Mental Health and especially as like Elise has been here for my whole journey almost about like professionalism versus being authentic and all of that. Like, I think it's really hard to grow until who you, you know who you are authentically, right? Until you get in touch with who you are, how you show up to the world, what's the most comfortable for you. Like understanding that first is what helps you move past that. But a lot of times we kind of, we have this like um, surface view or this, um, I don't say inadequate, but like this like very like, this is who I am and just accepting that I, as opposed to taking assessment and taking and really understanding like this is who I am but how is that impacting the people I care about how is that impacting the world and, and what I want in the future and what do I need to do to change that like you don't it's not about changing who you are to your core but it's about recognizing and understanding that if you want something different then you have to truly look at like how you're showing up to the world so I just feel like being able to assess who you are and being able to understand what does it mean for you to show up authentically but also like what areas do you need to be working on is the very first thing you have to do because it's so hard to grow if you're just like I'm gonna just be focused on what somebody else is doing and that's how I'm gonna spend, spend my energy I want to be like this person but if that doesn't fit who you are then like it, it's not gonna work like you truly have to know who you are first before you can even think about changing and growing mm -hmm. yeah I'm gonna piggyback off of that and I would say really critically examining your thoughts and your beliefs but also being really aware of what your core values are that is one of my favorite exercises, practices that I do uh, with my clients is in identifying what are your top three core values. Because when you are able to identify what's really important to you, what you really value, that can be your North Star in everything. If my core values are uh, family, spirituality, and freedom, then any decision that I make whether it's work, whether it's friendships, uh, wh whatever, those core values need to be aligned with my decisions. And I can't compromise my core values. My core values have to be non-negotiables. When we really find ourselves struggling or resentful or limited, it's because on some level we have negotiated our core values. We're hoping that maybe like in a relationship, the other person will come around to reflect our core values or we tell ourselves it's not as important to me. Maybe I'll get used to not having it. But time and time again, it's when our core values are not aligned with our life. So I would say get put some time aside to really identify what are your core values and then use that in your decision making. How is it lined up in your life? I mean, do an assessment like Ebony said. Is your work aligned right now with your core values? If it's not, that might be why you're not as happy as you are. Your health, is it aligned with your core values? If not, that may be why you're not happy right now. And that can, again, will allow you moving forward to be able to have more control about what your life looks like. If I, if I can identify my core values, live by my core values, I don't have to know all the answers. I don't have to know like what's gonna what's gonna happen and how do I do this. I just need to know that they're aligned with what I'm doing. Girl, you better preach. You better <laughs> preach for the people that's in that's in the background. You know, I I can relate to what both of you guys said, right? Because what you said in a nutshell is self awareness. You know, Absolutely. being um, authentic and assessing yourself, right, and getting to the core of who you are, and then the core values, knowing your three top core values. That those two things are so pivotal mm -hmm. when you are healing from a traumatic event. You guys, COVID was a traumatic event. Okay, Absolutely. rather not twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all of it. All of it. <laughs> right, right. All, all of it. The whole year. Right. Yes. The whole thing. The whole yeah. thing. You know, rather, rather you, you know, you caught COVID or not, it was still a traumatic event. And you guys know that I was a victim of sexual abuse. So along my healing journey, I had to, in order to really heal, I had to get to know who I was, right? Because who I was as a victim, I was that person out of survival, 
in order to survive the situation that I was in. That didn't necessarily mean that's who I wanted to be, right? So I had to get to know who, who am I? Who was I supposed to grow into had this situation never happened? And then as far as core values, I had to get some, girl. I had to get mm-hmm. some because I didn't know right. what it was. I didn't, right. I didn't even know what that yeah. was. What does that even mean? You know, and, and healing, healing from a traumatic event caused me mm-hmm. to have that realization and to embark on that journey. And you're so right. When you know your, your core values, then that's what you live by. Absolutely. Everything else, you know, falls into falls into place, and hopefully, your core values are in alignment with, you know, with the uh, with purpose. But also, too, okay, let me ask you guys this: Do you think core values can shift depending on what season you're in and and what you've gone through? Because your core values that you had five years ago, it may be something different now. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I think everything in life can evolve. Right. And so I may have thought I knew my values when I was 25, but at 35, it may be different. And at 45, it might be completely different. Like everything evolves. Um, and it's based on where you are in that in your space in life and what is important to you at that time. So what was important to me 10 years ago, not to say it's not important now, but it just may shift, especially if you feel like I've mastered that. I think there's a lot of things that we do. And it's like, so for me, one of my core values is safety. I'm really big about me feeling safe and me making sure anybody that's around me feels safe. So that's business, that's personal, whatever the case may be. I believe safety is such a huge thing. And so if I feel like at some point, like, I got that. Like, uh, I know how to make everybody feel safe. I feel safe. I don't go into spaces where I don't feel safe. Like if I feel like I have that, it's still important to me. But I think that there could be sometimes when you're like, okay, like I have that. I don't even have to think about that. So what else can I work on? And what else can be like an important factor of value in my life at that time? So I think everything in life has space to evolve. And I think over time you get more clarity too. Right. So, um, Alisa said, and I'm, I'm just thinking about these words of value. So Alisa said freedom. And I remember me and Alisa was in this like course or whatever. And we had to like identify our core values. Mm-hmm. And a big part of it was like, how do you define your values? So for me, freedom was very much about like financial freedom, freedom with like how I spend my time, freedom with like the decisions I make. Like, and so for, but for somebody completely different, freedom would look and sound completely different than it was for me. So I think getting clarity on like, what does this mean for you? It, it takes time for you to get there. So definitely your values will change. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Ooh, yeah. that was I, I kind of, I kind of look at, I'm kind of on the fence about it. I think like, yes, like Ebony said, I completely agree. We evolve and we change. And I think we start to have more clarity as our values go. And I don't know. I don't know if they will, will fundamentally change because I think what the way that I look at it, I'm like, oh, this has always been important to me. Like w- when I look back at, you know, 19 year old me, those were important to me back then. I just wasn't aware and mm. I was willing to compromise them more. Now, the way that I, that the, the external, the consequence of my values may be different. So maybe freedom back then was, I'm gonna go out and do what I wanna do. <laughs> <laughs> because you can also, that's the thing of why we have to be aware is because maybe I value freedom but actually the behaviors that I'm doing to achieve that freedom are maladaptive, right? Or they're, or they're dysfunctional in some way because maybe I thought going out, do whatever I want, I'm not gonna go to class was freedom. But in the long run, it was limiting my freedom because now uh, you failing your class and your financial aid is now um, at risk. You see what I'm saying? So I think being clear on whether the behaviors that you're taking are actually going to create more freedom or if if what you're doing is kind of like this pseudo freedom that you're that you're seeking. So I don't know. I think what I've learned about myself, especially, is those things were always my values. I just talked myself out of them a lot. I talked myself out of them a lot. I was willing to compromise them. But at the core, I don't think they have shifted that much I think what's developed is how I achieve it Mm, you know what I can I can um relate to that too relate to what both of you guys said because as you know when I came up out of the sexual abuse situation one of the things and this is something I haven't shared before but one of the things uh, when it comes to freedom one of the things that I wanted to do was to be intimate on 
on my terms, right? So that's mm -hmm. what freedom looked like for me. Now, I, I'm not saying that I was promiscuous or anything like that, but you know, that was it, it because that was something that was violated. That was something that was taken, taken away from me. You know, it was a choice that was taken away from me. So I wanted to choose my partners. That's what freedom looked like for me at that time in that victim mentality. But now freedom looks like what Ebony described early, earlier, financial freedom, you know, mm -hmm. freedom to just make my own decisions. Now is, you know, the freedom to just like move around and to travel all over the world. That's what I choose mm -hmm. to do because, you know, my abuser was really, really strict. I couldn't do nothing. I couldn't go nowhere. So now it's like, I want to go everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Because I have this freedom. So yeah, yeah. I, I I guess not to say that freedom is the core value, but I was able to relate to that because freedom meant something different, right? right? And also the consequence, like you said, the consequence of me, um, you know, not not sticking to my values also changed as well. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I could Definitely. totally relate. Totally relate to that. You know, one of the things that um, was really impacted by the pandemic were relationships, right? Was relationships because we had to go on quarantine, you know, we couldn't see people. Um, and I think that the pandemic tested a lot of our relationships, right? Just tested the, the strength of our relationships. And, you know, most times we always focus on, you know, how people, people did us wrong in a relationship. We're going to flip the script. What if we're the wrongdoer? What if we're the wrongdoer <laughs> yep. in the relationship and we want to savor, you know, that relationship? How do we do that? How do we wreck us out a relationship that we want to say if we are the wrongdoer? Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, do we have time? Do we have time? <laughs> right, right. It, it's, it's one of those things where obviously um, one, the, one of the reasons why people struggle with relationships is that it's not just you, it's another person there. And so you have to recognize that the decisions you make and the the way that you approach or, or whatever happens in that relationship is just not about one person. And so even when we're talking about getting into a relationship, like that's a topic that comes up a lot. Like, well, I can accomplish all the rest of my goals, but like getting into a relationship I struggle with. Well, that's the one that takes someone else. It's not just you making a decision. I'm going to do all these things to achieve this. Um, and so when it comes to like being in a relationship and if you know that maybe you weren't showing up the way you needed to, um, I think it's it's important. And, and again, you cannot control anything but yourself. You cannot predict how anybody's going to take anything, but I'm really big on accountability. I think that is so important for people to recognize if I know that I wasn't showing up the way that I should have been showing up and I'm recognizing like, hey, there were areas where I I needed to be doing more or I wasn't doing my best or I wasn't, um, I'm part of the problem, right? Which because Elisa and I are both LMFTs, which is marriage and family therapists, we're both very big on like, what does the, the whole picture look like? Like, I'm not just looking at it from your perspective. If you come to me and you're like, I'm in this horrible relationship and it's, there, it's them, it's them, it's them, it's them. And I'm like, but you're in the relationship. So that means you work within the cycle. That means you have a part to do with this. And so a big, a big thing is like making sure that you recognize like I was a part of creating this and I'm also a part of sustaining this. Like you can't put that on someone else because healthy people don't stay in unhealthy relationships most of the time. Like we're not just sitting here like you could treat me like trash. You can, you know, be mean to me or you can be this horrible person, but I'm gonna stay with you anyway because I'm a good, healthy person. That's not typically how that works. So when you find yourself in those situations, a big part of it is like, how much are you being accountable for it? And then if you recognize like, this is my part, are you speaking up? Are you saying like, hey, this is something that I realize I, how I'm contributing and I'm gonna shift that. And the hardest part about shifting is that everybody's not going to be open to it. Your partner may not be okay with the fact that you're shifting this and that you're saying like, I'm no longer participating in this healthy part. I mean, this unhealthy part of our relationship. Um, and, and like I said, you can do your part. You can, you can take accountability. You can truly show up and say like, I'm going to be different because I recognize how I've showed up in the past. And so I need to do something different. Mm -hmm. The hard part is that everybody's not going to be there for that. They may, right. they may not be okay with it. Yeah, right. I, I echo a lot of all of what Ebony said. And I, I would say to also be do this time to take accountability. Yes. And to figure out your relationship patterns. 
right? Because maybe you're at this point, I want to save the relationship. Wonderful. One, why? Why do you mm. want to save the relationship? Also, what are the things that you kind of keep doing over and over again? Uh, Ebony, like as Ebony mentioned, as marriage and family therapist, we look at the big picture. We look at all of the relationships. So what were your early childhood relationships like? What patterns, what beliefs about love did you begin to form back then? What did you begin to believe about yourself in a relationship? And again, why are you trying to save this relationship? As Ebony said, it's never all one person. So you can't take complete accountability for, you can take accountability for your actions and for your contributions, but make sure you're not taking accountability for your partner's um, addition to that as well. But if you recognize that you were the one that was doing the, the most kind of damage in some way to the relationship, build your awareness, figure out why, what was motivating you, and then a proper apology, right? So an apology is more than just saying, I'm sorry. It's, I'm sorry. I realize now the impact that this had on the relationship and also probably on you. I expect you were probably feeling these things etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Let them know what you're going to do moving forward so that you're not back in that same situation when you try it again, right? And then also committing to, to, to doing the work that is required to not have that repeat again. Because the other person has to really know that you get it. Mm -hmm. If they really understand like, okay, you get it and you validated me and you took ownership, they may or may not be more inclined to do it, to, to, to try and repair the situation. Mm -hmm. But I would say own it. And as Ebony said, you got to give the other person also the space and respect that that may not be where they're at. So do the work for you so that you exit this relationship feeling really good about how you ultimately exited it and learn the lessons you needed to learn, continue to build that self-awareness and integrate that into your future relationship. I love that. You know, you guys had me think back to uh, when I was dating my husband, and I've shared this on the podcast before, because um, during a dating phase, he broke up with me. And he, when he broke up with me, he said that he was breaking up with me because um, I acted like, you know, I, I didn't need him. There was no, he didn't see no room in my life for him. He said that he felt as though that he was an accessory as if I got my purse and got my shoes. Now I got mm -hmm. my hand I'm going to put on my arm. So I, you know, I complete, he completed my outfit. Like that's how I made him feel. And so when, when he said that, you know, I want to snap off, but then it kind of like <laughs> hit me like a ton of bricks because I'm like, yo, the last guy that I dated said something similar, mm. not the exact same words, but he said something similar. He too said that he felt as though that there was no room for him in my life. And so to hear my, my then boyfriend, now husband say that, you know, it made me stop and it made me reflect on what I was doing like why am I why am I acting like this and once again it went back to my childhood trauma because you know as a victim of sexual abuse I created this list y'all know the list that <laughs> y'all know the list I created this 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 list and I had this you know crazy idea. I don't even know if crazy is the right word, but this idea of what independent woman should act like and should look like, because no matter what, I was not going to, you know, date a guy that will potentially or, or had the, you mm -hmm. know, capacity to abuse my child. Right. And so, man, it like, it, it really took some, some deep soul searching to, to mm -hmm. get to and um, obviously I wanted to, to savor the relationship and I ended up just like talking to him. I don't think I apologized though, but tried to get him to understand, you know, okay, I, I get it. I'm the first generation, everything in my family. So everything, you know, I feel like everything falls on me to get right, to be the first one to, to do it and to succeed or, or whatever. I've been, I'm used to, no one coming to my rescue mm. and having to do everything so mm -hmm. it can possibly come off like that so you know um we talked we got back together you know the rest is history because we <laughs> now, but we together but, 
<laughs> it worked out. It right. Worked out. Mm -hmm. It worked out, but you know, when you guys were talking, it made me think about that because I, mm -hmm. I could have missed out on a really good thing, you know, had I not took that opportunity to just like reflect, like, okay, yeah. common denominator, like, yeah. no, mm -hmm. guys perfect because my husband ain't perfect, you know, mm -hmm. the other guy, the other look ahead, he wasn't perfect either, but <laughs> what am I contributing to these relationships that's causing them to, you know, to feel this way? And yeah me doing that let me just make it clear for you guys me doing that did not excuse any wrongdoings on their part it right it, it was just a, a way for me to empower myself mm -hmm. that's it. That's it. i think that's really it's it's really important to be able to say like how am i contributing to this um because yeah. it like you said it's so easy to be like well you tripping are you doing this and you're not perfect and it's like yeah but nobody is and so how do I contribute to whatever dynamic we have how do I contribute to why I'm single or why I can't find the person like like I said I think that's the one thing you have to recognize it does take two people so you can't control everything but you can't focus on like what am I doing and who am I and how am I showing up and what you said is such a common thing that I've heard and specifically because I work with mostly black um couples and individuals individuals for black women is very much like we've been taught to be these independent people that have our stuff together and do everything and so when men come in they're just like it feels like you just had like a cutout of a man in your life and you wanted me to be right there and so then it doesn't feel like I'm truly contributing anything it's just like just fit in this hole that I've made for you I have everything else together and that's it and and you know that they, they don't want to be just like the person that gets put in a little pocket in your life and that's it so I think what you're saying is very important yeah and the the piece that you said about empowered I wanted to empower myself that is it I was like yes that's it that's why we do this work it yeah. is not so that we don't do this self-reflective self-awareness, all of this to bash ourselves to shame ourselves, be like, look at how you're messing up. Like, no, it is to empower ourselves because if we can understand my life is a reflection of, it is, is a consequence of all previous decisions. Now, I'm not going to beat myself up if I've made decisions that now I'm in a position where I'm struggling, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, just like I made that decision, can make a different decision right so that's the power in self-awareness work and self-reflection and healing is that it empowers you it empowers you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree I agree and, you know and since I so candidly brought up you know sexual abuse let's switch the conversation a little bit and have some real grown folk talk and talk about okay. another and talk about another taboo topic which is you know sex Let's, let's talk about that for That's our specialty. <laughs> right. Exactly. I was, just about to say that. I was just about to say that. You know, Elisa, you specialize in sexual awareness and Ebony, you have a whole podcast, you know, <laughs> sex and relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So why is our sexual wellness important? And, you know, does having a healthy sex life even affect the quality of our, you know, our life's experiences? You want to go first, Elisa? Yeah, absolutely. 100%, right? Like, you know, is our physical health part of our wellness? Absolutely. Nobody has any question about that. Our sexual health is part of our health, our overall health. And why it's also uh, an extension of our mental health, I would say is because for so many of us, so many of us, there is a great, in particular for women, there is a great deal of shame that is associated with sex and being a sexual woman. And what does that mean? I'll often ask uh, clients, you know, when you hear the term sexual woman, right? Mm -hmm. Like how would you describe her? When What comes to mind when you think of a woman who is owning her sexuality, I'm about to right? Say, and I'm so the what video, but y'all don't pay attention to it. <laughs> we definitely paid, <laughs> right? You know what you're talking and about. <laughs> <laughs> for some people, yeah, like, so for some people, even though it, women and men alike, it's like, yeah, of course, being progressive and women should own, but then the, the adjectives that they choose to describe their, this, this woman are often negative. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much head trash that we have around sexuality. So one, again, shame is one of the things that can 
dramatically impact our mental health, which our mental health is correlated to our physical health, right? Like whatever we might be struggling with, it also impacts what manifests in our body, right? So that's correlated. Our sexual health also, having a happy, healthy sex life can help you live longer. It boosts your immune system. Um, it gives you a higher quality of life. Like that's just fact. So, but so many of us, I think in the other piece are disconnected in particular as women, in particular as black and brown women. There is so much crap associated around sex for us and how we have historically been cut off from our sexuality. The sexuality that was associated with black and brown women is that it was a function for other people, in particular, cis, you know, heterosexual um, men, right? That it was a function for them. It was to pro procreate, but it was never centered around us and around our health. You see all of the attacks on women's reproductive rights that are going on, right? Why? Why? Because it is, it is trying to control our bodies. Why? You know, if, I mean, we could have a whole session about that, but... <laughs> But yes, I mean, being able to make decisions about our bodies, being able to um, give consent to what happens to our bodies, being able to enjoy what is a divine right, right? That our bodies are wired to experience sexual pleasure. Why? The divine birthright that we have. And yet, where do we get those messages, right? Most of us don't get that growing up we are not even able to properly name our body part. So the other part of sexual health is that we have to understand what's happening in our body. You know, I have to know like when there's something different going in my body and be able to seek out, you know, medical treatment if needed. So yes, absolutely it is part of our overall health and an integral part of having a full, full life. Definitely. I think, I mean, you know, Elisa got that. <laughs> <laughs> But no, that I think what you're saying is 100% true, 100% true. And even what you said about like understanding the messages, that's really what I like to focus on is the understanding of like, we get so many messages when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to our sexual, us as sexual beings, our reproductive, all of that, we get so many different messages and truly understanding how that impacts us. Like, I think um, I, I wasn't raised in an extremely religious household, but I was definitely raised in a household that was like, don't have sex, don't get pregnant. You know, if you get pregnant, that's the worst thing in the world. And da da da. da. And then of course, I think about people that are raised in more religious households. It's like no sex, no sex, no sex, no sex. And then when you get married, please your husband, please your husband, please your husband. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait, how? Mm -hmm. Or right. Uh, once you get to a certain age, parents are like, why you ain't had no babies yet? Why I ain't got no grandkids? And it's like, what? You taught me the first right. 25 years to focus on myself. Don't get pregnant, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel like we have all of these mixed messages that kind of mess with us, right? So it's really hard mm -hmm. for me to like own my sexuality when everyone is telling me what I should and shouldn't be doing. Don't wear short shorts around that man because he may not be able to control himself. Not to mm -hmm. say that you're a kid and it shouldn't matter if that person can control himself or not. So it's just so many messages. And so we truly have to like work through how do I share myself of all of this like stigma? How do I share myself of all of these beliefs that people have put on top of me and really own who I am? And what Elisa said earlier about like, how do we view someone who's sexually open and free and, and just in tune with who, who they are sexually truly does impact whether or not we're able to own that ourselves. Because if the first thought you think of is like, Ugh, she's out there, she's nasty, she's this, she's that, then like, well, how would you own your sexuality if that's what you think comes with it? Because there are plenty mm -hmm. of people that own their sexuality that don't, don't look the way you think they look you know they but they that doesn't mean that they're not okay with who they are as a sexual being so it's so important because again this is who we are to our core and this is us owning all of these different areas of us and, and accepting like i am a multi multi-faceted person who has different personalities who's in text intellectual who's mm -hmm. sexual who's sweet who's quiet who's humble who's submissive but also dominant and like we all have all of these things but we struggle that with that a lot especially when it comes to our sexuality we're so like if we don't fit into the box that other people think we should fit into mm -hmm. it makes us feel like we're not adequate enough for anybody else 
Wow, you're absolutely right. I agree with both of you guys. You know, um, for me, like I had to grab hold of my sexuality too, you know, to to really come up out of the shyness because mm-hmm. going through the abuse, it made me shy, you know, because like you said, Ebony, you know, being a child with these short shorts, oh, you know, you're gonna entice a grown, grown ass man. So that was obviously- Not your problem. Right, not my problem. I was, <laughs> I was eight years old, that was, you know, you pretty much a description of, of my childhood. So once I got, once I turned 30, I, I chose, I was like, you know what? I'm going to take control of my sexuality. Like, why am I ashamed of my body? Because I realized that I was, you know, kind of shameful of my body and I didn't want to be. Like, I have these curves, you know? I, I mm-hmm. have, I look like this. I'm, I'm blessed. I don't want to, I don't want to hate it. And so one of the things that I, that I did to truly embrace, embrace is that when I turned 30, I took some semi new portraits and it wasn't for everybody else. It was literally for me. It was literally mm-hmm. me finally saying I can love all of me. Cause number one, right. growing up in the hood and the projects outside of Chicago, first off, I didn't even think that I would even like live to see 30, let's start there, right? Mm. To reach 30 and be successful, house, you know, two degrees up under my belt, you know, in a relationship that's a healthy relationship, you know, I've healed and, and forgave the abuser and all this. It, I felt like the last piece of the puzzle was embracing my body. Mm. And so that was one of the one of the um, ways that, that I chose to, you know, to embrace my body. And it's, these are not pictures that I didn't show everybody. It wasn't, it's not even like that because it was for me. It was right. like, right. Ooh, I'm grown and it's yeah. okay to just love, you know, all of me. It's, it's, it's yeah. Not, now I'm not shy. You can't keep me from in front of my camera. <laughs> <laughs> Show it out. <laughs> just sure now. So, so you guys, for the 21 and older crew, give us some tips on embracing our sexuality so we can have confidence to operate in our purpose. Because I truly believe that was also a part of, I'm doing like this because y'all can't see, it's because I got the picture on my wall. But I truly believe me embracing who I am and my sexuality really helped me to operate in purpose. So can you give us, give, give the people some tips? on how to I think I, What you're saying is so much of who are you as a whole person? Right. A lot of times we are so focused on like, I am only able to show these parts of me. And so like people accept the intellectual part, but then even in some circles, it's like, I have to dumb it down because it's not okay. Right. And so I think embracing your sexuality is about like, I am all of these things and I am amazing with all of these different parts of me. Um, And so a big part of it is like, how do you explore and accept and understand it for yourself and not for anybody else? Mm -hmm. So to your point, I, I, I'm going to take these pictures because I want to make sure that I'm confident. I want to make sure that how I feel right now, even if I change nothing about my life. Um, I was listening to this podcast and, and one of the hosts was like, I had to learn how I am right now is wonderfully made and is completely acceptable. And I am worthy of everything, even if I change nothing. Right. Because so many times we focus on what can I change? I need to be more of a sexual person. I need to be more of a modest person. I need, you know, we focus on the changing part. And that's the part where we start to feel like, okay, once I get here, then I'm worthy. And so I think recognizing and accepting all of you right now. And yes, are there areas that we always want to grow, want to do better, and all that kind of stuff? Is yep, yeah, that's part of life. But I also have to understand whether not if nothing changes or if everything changes, I am worthy. So I think that's the first part of it for me. Mm. Yeah. Uh, When I think of embracing my sexuality, I think of being shame free, being shame free of anything that pertains to my sexuality. So where I would begin is exploring, are there areas of my sexuality or when I think about sex or I think about my body or I think about my sexual body parts, my genitals, that there's some that there's some shame around that. So then I want to explore that, right? I want to get really critical about where the shame is coming from. What are the beliefs I have about my body? What are the beliefs I have about enjoying sex? What are the beliefs that I have about different types of sex? What are the beliefs I have about um, exploring my body on my own, right? Are they my beliefs, right? Are they my beliefs? So I would say, um, be really aware if there's any shame in any area, then pull the thread, explore where that's coming from. Are these still your values? Are some of the values that you have 
really yours? Are the beliefs that you have, are they really yours or are they what was passed down to you? For so many of us, we get these messages everywhere, everywhere, but a lot of them were messages passed down by the women in our lives. And so some of these messages for the women before us, they were literally messages that were going to keep them safe and surviving, right? And so that may not be the exact place that we're at right now. Uh, a big part of this often will, will, will intersect with our spirituality and what we believe about sex and spirituality. Can I be a sexual woman who embraces her sexuality and is also spiritual? So I would say explore a lot of the beliefs that you have and get some solid sex education. Uh, one of my dear friends and colleagues and doctor of pelvic floor therapy um, extraordinaire uh, Uchenna, uh, if you look her up on Instagram, you see logic. Um, she talks about grown folks sex ed, right? Because so many of us did not receive comprehensive sex education and it shows, right? Mm -hmm. So it shows in our expectations about sex, in our expectations of what our bodies do, of what our partners do. So I would say really go on this exploration of what you believe it to be there may be some healing that you need to do around the way. And then last, I would say, just like I talked about your core values, what are your sexual values, right? How do they relate to those core values you were talking about? What are your sexual values in a relationship? And then also what are your thoughts and your hangups around pleasure, mm. right? So many of us may think of sex and it's kind of like this extension of something that I do in the relationship. Are you enjoying it? right? What are your hangups around pleasure, around sensuality? So there's so much to explore. And I would say start with those beliefs and start with identifying where you might have shame. In. Man, you guys, I may need to bring y'all back so we can just talk about, <laughs> you go deeper into it because, it <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because that's deep. I never even thought to have or, or to create sexual values you know absolutely and uh and i'm gonna check out um you say you see logic on instagram yes she's awesome. yes I'm, she's a, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to check her out because it's, it's so funny that you say you know sex education because you would think i don't know maybe it's just me but as an adult i'm like mm, shame to get sex education because you're supposed to know it right i'm an adult when know. who taught you that though <laughs> right 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 Right. Uh, yeah. we, already, we already know my first introduction to sex so you know right. well, yeah. so that's the thing too and, and this is why I get like so amped up and I'm so passionate about it in particular for women in particular for black latinx women brown women indigenous women is because this is one way we stay disempowered it, it, historically in current day controlling women's sexuality Controlling them by fear and by shame has been how women have been historically controlled. And so it is often that one place, like Ebony talked about before, I, I also work with a lot of high functioning um, professional women who have everything going well. And then there's this one area that's often related to sex that is just not fitting. Why didn't you get that information? Why? Because the more misinformed you are, the easier it is to control. You. So once a woman in particular begins to get the information and release herself from shame, she opens a whole uh, bunch of other opportunities and frees herself in a way that women have historically not been allowed to free themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I, you got my wheels are turning because you, you're, you're absolutely right. Fear, shame. Yeah. Absolutely. That's that's like the best way to. That's the way. Oh. If you look at any of the messages, it's like, you're going to be a hoe. You're going to be shunned away. This may, These are all the ways that you, you're not going to be wanted. No man is going to ever want to want you. And, and also like the messages of why you need a man, right? Yeah. Like you need a yeah. man for that. So, oh, there's so much stuff around it. So much stuff. I would also say, like, check out some solid books um, that have common, uh, that have solid education for grown folks. Come As You Are by ne Emily Nagowski is like the book 
around women's sexual health. Yeah. Um, excellent book. There's also a workbook that I love called The Conscious Sexual Self by Melissa, I think her last name is Fritchie, it's like F-R-I-T-C. H-E, something like that. You can find it on Amazon. Um, another great one because it's a workbook and it will prompt you with a bunch of different types of these questions to help you explore some of these beliefs. So those are really two great places to begin. Mm-hmm. Man, that was a that was a great segue because I was going to ask you guys for book or audible book recommendations. So you guys make sure to click the link in the show notes that says audible recommendations because I'll make sure to put everything everything there. Ebony, do you have any book recommendations you would like to share? Definitely those as far as like sexuality. Um, another book that I really like that um, it depends on how you feel, but there's one called Self Therapy by Jay Early. And it's really good, like when I was saying, like we all have these different parts of us that show up and how do we kind of are concerned about um, whether or not they are showing up in a healthy way or whether or not they're not or what's okay for me to show the world versus what's not okay for me to show the world. Um, Self-therapy is really good. It's all about like understanding these different parts of you and then how do you understand who you are to your core and then show that to the world. Uh, Another book that isn't necessarily around therapy or relationships, but I just think it's amazing is The Big Leap. Um, and it's by Gay Hendricks, Dr. Gay Hendricks. Um, and that is all about these limiting beliefs that we have and these things that kind of stop us from reaching our fullest potential. I think anyone that has like goals and, and wants to have live their life to their most authentic self and being very much living and, and doing what makes them feel good the most, most of the time, that's a really good book to look at as a big leap. Yeah. One more that I have that's around fear, um, more of a book on, it's more a book on kind of philosophy, spirituality, so, it's, uh, so to speak, is by Thich Nhat Hanh. It's called Fear and a really small little book, really easy to read. But I love that book because he talks about at the core of how fear impacts us, how it limits us, how it shows up, how others respond to it. So I think as we're moving into 2021 and 2020 in particular was a fear-based year um, because of what was going on, because of what we were seeing. Um, It continues to be so much fear still going on. I don't think we're like out of that. And you can also see how much fear was was kind of um, fed to us, again, to control us. And so this book in particular has helped me at times where I was feeling more of the fear than usual to really help me to get grounded and to really see how it was playing out in my own. So fear by thick not conscious. Man, thank you for that. I'm gonna put all the in the in the link in the show notes and I'm gonna have to check them out to see um, if there are, are audio versions. Y'all, I could talk there to is. you all. There is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There you, go. you guys, I could talk to y'all all day. <laughs> yeah, it's a great combo. Yeah, and y'all are so amazing. Y'all are so amazing. I love you. I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to meet. But before I let you guys go, I have one last question. So, when describing the meaning of living your truth, I want you to complete this phrase when I give you these two words, and both of you guys can give your individual words. So, the words are self awareness, purpose, and your third word authenticity that's just that's I don't know where this came from but probably the last two years if you ever hear an interview by me if you ever hear me talking to anybody else I am talking about authenticity I just think that it once you are aware of who you are and once you start to show up fully as yourself in the world you will be amazed at the opportunities that you get and, and just how calm and at peace you feel because so much is, and again, I know we keep talking about Black and Latinx and Black and Latinx, but that's just the reality. As brown and Black women, we always feel like we have to have these masks on and we have to show up a certain way and we can't. And so when you find spaces where you know, I can just be me, and especially if you're able to build a career around just being you, like it's just so much like relief and calmness that just surrounds you where it doesn't feel like I have to like put on this show. So to me, authenticity is that third word that has to be a part of it. Mm, I love that. I would say self-love. Self-love would be the third one for me because I think, again, especially as Black 
and brown women, <laughs> indigenous women, black women, we are taught to that we are less than. We're taught that we are not as of much value or that our lives don't matter. Um, we're not the ideal woman. I mean, that's so many of the messages that we get. So to exist in a world where I'm told that I am not of value and love myself is really revolutionary, right? Mm -hmm. And also the more that I begin to love myself, not in this um, ego-driven way, but to really extend compassion, nurturing, care, love to myself, like that that I have for others, that changes everything. Because now I am not driven by fear. Now I can actually extend more of myself to others because I'm taking really deep, care of myself, mm -hmm. right? Self-love being more than just um, this phrase that I think we often hear of, like, I'm gonna love myself and that's all great and dandy, but it's self-love is also in the day-to-day. -day. It's how I treat my body. It's the, it's the internal messaging that I allow to run or that I interrupt when I'm beating myself up. It's the relationships that I choose to be in. Um, so self-love to me would be also, um, at the core of what has to drive me. It's the relationships I choose to be in. Ooh. Amen. <laughs> oh, catch that. Self-love is not all about those massages, y'all. No. <laughs> They're fun too. Exactly. They're fun too. They're fun but it's too. deeper than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, y'all are amazing. Have y'all heard that yet today? <laughs> thank you thank you you are amazing takes one to no one takes one to know yes one. So thank, thank you. you yes we are your reflection exactly thank you, thank exactly you. this was so much fun this was so much fun thank i'm you. serious about bringing you guys back though i'm serious about bringing you back let us know let, let us, us know, know. <laughs> now i told you this was going to be some grown folk conversation then i tell you that so hopefully you left your shrewdness and the kids in the other room like i had already warned you <laughs> But seriously, I hope that you really enjoyed and learned something from this conversation because our mental health is also important. And you know that I am a firm advocate of therapy. If you have listened to any episode on this podcast, if you have followed me across social media or heard me speak at an event, or if you are a student of one of my classes, you know that I am a huge advocate of therapy. And it doesn't matter what you're striving to achieve. If you have a mindset block or a trauma that goes unresolved, your journey to success becomes much harder than it has to be. So please get help no matter how big or how small you think the problem is. And you can start by visiting melaninandmentalhelp.com to find the right therapist for you. So family, before I let you go, I just want to give a quick announcement. For the next two months, I'm pressing the pause button on the podcast. I have a major project to handle in my business, and I only have a very small team. So with that being said, this project needs my undivided attention. And guess what? Your prayers are needed and welcomed as well. Family, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my podcast every single week if you need help creating a strategy that's needed to manifest the life that you desire and deserve then head on over to strategizeyourvision.com to enroll in class the doors are still open but not for long so definitely sign up today also note that all audible recommendations given on any episode are linked in the show notes below and you can try audible for free Please remember to leave a five-star rating and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Also, don't forget to click the join community link that's in the show notes so we can stay connected. Family, as you know, I said I love to go to touch one million hearts within the first two years of the podcast, and I can only do it with your help. So please remember to download each episode, share the conversation with at least four people you know, and repost on social media. And don't forget to tag me at Lakeisha Woodard. Well, family, I appreciate you. My heart is filled with so much gratitude. Until next time, always remember that you are enough and your truth is beautiful. Bye.